Happy New Year, Fleur de Nemitha, and welcome to my new video with me, Naomi, and my customary cup of tea. So today we're going to be talking all about my favourite books from 2018. So since it was 2018, I thought I would choose my top 8 books. However, I do have two special honourable mentions and they didn't make the list because I felt like they surpassed the list, almost. I felt like they were too important a book to put on a list, so these are going to be mentioned at the end of the video. So I hope you guys stick around to find out what the honourable mentions are. So I actually don't have hardly any of my books with me besides the two honourable mentions because as many of you know I spent most of the Christmas and New Year in Edmonton, Canada with my fiancé Chad. I'm in the process of moving here over the next year and I unfortunately don't have my books from home with me. I do however have new books I've collected. So the books aren't in any particular order, I'm just going to list them from 1 to 8 in the order that they were read. So 1 isn't the best and 8 isn't the worst and vice versa. So the first book I want to talk about is The Lost Boy by Christina Henry. So this book was recommended to me by one of my best friends Priscilla and I'm so glad I read it. So The Lost Boy follows the story of Peter Pan and his best friend Jamie and the story is all about how Captain Hook came to be. Throughout the, the whole story we find out more about Neverland, about the fairies and about the magic that keeps Neverland the way it is and why boys never age. It was heart-wrenching, it was beautiful, it was angering and it was sweet. I loved every second of it and I honestly ploughed through this in January and I was really sad when it ended and the fact that there isn't another one in this series because I just want her to write a part two. I don't know what she would write about in part two but there just needs to be a part two because honestly this is such a good book. The characters were very very real Peter Pan was written amazingly, like I hated him at the end, I was like you are a massive dick but his character was so well written that you can't help enjoy reading about him and just reading to find out more about him. So the next book I read that I absolutely adored was The Shock of the Fall by Nathan Filer. I actually met Nathan Filer when he came to my university to do a talk, he's actually an alumni of the course I did. Um, and he came in and he talked about the shock of the fall, his process and our masters and just what came afterwards. He is such a lovely man and I had the best time talking with him and I had the amazing opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him after and as someone who is also writing about mental health, his advice was beyond valuable and I think that contributes a little bit to why this book made my list. It talks about mental health, it talks about loss, it talks about grief and it does so in such a real and beautiful way. So the story is about a young boy who loses his brother as a child and the story follows him growing up and the difficulties that this has caused not only in himself but in his family and if you know me in person I really dislike crying over films and books if I can I will like suck it in so hard that it burns uh, especially with other people around but when I was reading The Shock of the Fall there was more than once where I just I just had to let those tears fall I just had to let them out because otherwise I was just gonna choke on them so yeah. <laughs> so no list of mine would be complete without a Louise O'Neill book. So this year I read The Surface Breaks. It is a feminist retelling of The Little Mermaid and I adored it. While on retrospect <laughs> I do think that it, it could have been a little bit better. Ugh, I don't want to say better because I love Louise O'Neill so much but I think I, I personally would have changed a couple of things throughout the story. But beside that it was honestly such a wonderful story. I think it stays quite true to the original tale and I think it is one of caution. We as women I think are told to give up everything for men, especially teenagers. I know that as a teenager I felt like I had to, like my worth was tied to my beauty and what I could offer men. And that's just how society is unfortunately. I do think it's changing a little bit and I really hope I'm right but this was a tale of a young girl and she is beautiful but she is told to be silent even when she does have a voice. She lives in a patriarchal society both underwater and unfortunately above water. It is about naivety, it is about finding your own voice even when you don't have one. It is very hard to read in parts, very true to the original story. Um, the mermaid does not have a lovely time on land. Her feet bleed like physically bleed and are falling apart and 
yeah, I was just angry for 90% of this book. Actually, me and my friend Abby were like reading it at similar times and we were just texting each other back and forth in cat blocks, screaming about how angry the book made us, which I think is a good thing. I like having visceral and like really big reactions to books. So I think Louise O'Neill did a great job there. So perhaps one of my favourite books of the year is coming up next and this is An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson. So I waited for this book for months. Like it was out in, uh, I don't know if it was, yeah it was out in Canada and America much sooner than it was in the UK and I was just so angry. I was going to, all, to my favourite bookshop more than once asking if they had it and they just kept saying not yet, not yet. But I pre-ordered it and when it came in I literally dashed straight to the city centre to get it because I could not contain my excitement. It is the story of a young woman who lives in a world where fae are a part of it. And the fae in this world, interestingly enough, cannot create things, which I think is really good because when we think of fae, we think of something of an elevated human who have things that we do not have. And I think sometimes it's easy to, when you read about fae, I'm always like, oh my God, I wish I was this cool, I wish I was this pretty, um, which again is probably says more about society than it should. But <laughs> in Margaret Rogerson's version of the tales, these fae cannot create things, so they have given up, in a sense, their mortality and their ability to create beautiful things in order to be this beautiful thing themselves. And I really enjoyed that premise. So the story follows Isabel, who is a, well, is the best portrait painter where she lives. And she is commissioned to do a portrait by the Autumn Prince himself, who is called Rook. However, things don't really go as planned because she does something really bad and that is she paints mortal sorrow in his eyes. The story is about them and their journey and there are so many realistic parts that I just, it's like it contributes to why I love it. So whenever I read like journey stories, I always think, don't they use people shower? Don't they wash their hands? Don't they ever need to go to the bathroom? And as someone who has quite severe OCD who needs to shower every day, I'm always like, like, I want to be in an adventure book, but I just could not because apparently no one showers, no one goes to the bathroom, and I could not handle that. But there's a really great scene where she is talking about how sweaty and gross she is and how much she needs to go to the bathroom. And she goes and he's just, as a, as a fae who doesn't understand, is like watching her squat and lift her dress. And I was just, honestly, I laughed out loud. With that. And I loved that. I loved how realistic that was. And I think that's why I connected so deeply to this book. That, and I also love all things autumn. Like, if you can't tell, I'm missing autumn. And these are actually little maple leaves, partly because I'm in Canada, partly because I am never ready to let go of autumn. So the next book I absolutely adored is actually quite special to me because it is set in Wales, or a bit more of a fantastical Wales. So I was lucky enough to receive a copy of this book when I was volunteering at the Bath Children's Literature Festival a year or two ago. And it is called The Beast is an Animal. And I'm gonna have to read the, the author's name and please, please forgive me if I butcher it. And it is by Petronelle Van Arsdale. I'm pretty sure it's Dutch. I have that on good authority from my Dutch friend, but it could be Danish and it could be something else. But I'm so sorry if I said it wrong. But thank you. Thank you so much for writing a book that's set in Wales. As someone who was I was growing up in Wales, I'm very Welsh. I went to an all Welsh school from the age of like seven up until, how old was I, 19, which is all Welsh, not English. So to see Welsh words in a book and to, and to know that this is my culture that's kind of being represented, even if it is in a fantastical setting, was just so wonderful for me. Like this hardly ever happens, like even in movies, because if you haven't read Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, I think that's what it's called, it's probably not and I'm gonna be the worst person, worst booktuber ever. But in that film and in the book, they go to Wales and this is where the cat the um the home is, but hardly no one has a Welsh accent and that really upset me. But anyway, so this book is set in Wales and it talks about beat, which is interesting because that means world in Welsh. And it's about this young girl and she survives a tragedy in her village in which two spirit forest like young women come and kill all the adults and the children of this town are sent to another and it is about how they grow up and how they are ostracized and it is about this one young girl who ends up meeting the beast and i really enjoyed this it was almost like a frankenstein 
esque theme going on where you have to question is the beast good is the beast bad and is it all just up to perspective so i love books that made me think so for so many reasons not only that but it was actually written so wonderfully and we follow this girl from young childhood to early adulthood and we see through we see her through sorrow through heartache through anger through rage through strength through love through heartache again and yeah i just absolutely adore this book and I haven't heard it being spoken about before and I think I'm definitely going to check out more of Ron Asdale's books if I get the opportunity. Okay, so number six is The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Okay, I initially raved about this book way too much for it to be okay. Actually, I love these books so much that I went out and I bought, I actually was super lucky, I found the Tith trilogy in a library sale and I had them all and I've already read two. I want to wait. I'm gonna like read a couple of books in between before I finish it off just because I want to come back to it with like super fresh eyes but Holly Black writes the best worlds ever her worlds are so real they're so in-depth they're so detailed that I just literally ate it up like that fairy fruit that you're really not supposed to so the story follows two twins obviously there's two of them the twins <laughs> the story follows twin girls Taryn and Jude also their sister but it's mainly about those two and they are orphaned when a fairy comes and kills their parents and the older sibling is actually his child. So out of duty he takes them back to fairyland where they are raised. So Jude and Taryn try to navigate themselves and try to just live in a world where they really really don't belong. While Taryn longs to find love so she can be accepted through, the, through marriage. Jude, on the other hand, wants to make herself strong. She wants to be seen as a strong woman and she wants to make a name for herself. Because of this, she is an easy target for the cruel Prince Cardin and his group of friends who are just, honestly, the actual worst. Like, just the worst. Actually, two characters from the Tith trilogy turn up and that makes me so excited. We see Robin and Kay. Which I honestly, so I read The Crew Prince first, so I didn't know about it. And then afterwards, when I was reading the Titular I was like, I have heard this name before. I know I've heard this name before. And so I googled it, and lo and behold, they do appear in The Crew Prince. And what's even better is The Wicked King is out this month. I have ordered, I pre-ordered pre it. I think I pre-ordered a signed copy. And yeah, I'm just... Oh, words cannot like ex describe how happy I am and how excited I am, and I intend to reread *The Cruel Prince*, all in preparation for *The Wicked King*. So the next book I absolutely adored was *The Bear and the Nightingale* by Catherine Arden. This book is a, I want to call it historical fiction almost, but it is a fantasy, and it is set in Russia or Rus, Rus, back in the time in which it's set. Which you'll have to forgive me, I have forgotten. So the story follows young Vasya, who grows up, not the prettiest of girls, but with a wild heart. She has green eyes and is thought of as a witch by many people, especially when she discovers that she is able to see spirits out of traditional folklore that others cannot. So this book is really interesting. There are so many parts that could be explicitly historical fiction, such as when they sit down for dinner, and usually I would find that probably quite boring you know like there are pages sometimes of just the workings of the kitchen and the family and but, oh Catherine Arden writes it in such a fantastic way that I just ate it up this might be because I do have an interest in um, historical fiction especially Russia I really enjoy a lot of Russian history especially you know all the whole Romanovs so this was really nice to read about because so I felt like I learned a lot while enjoying a lovely fantastical story and I think many people would enjoy it, especially with this season. It's actually snowing right now in Edmonton and I kind of wish it was, I kind of wish I had the second one so I could just curl up with a good book and read about snow while being in all the snow. And the last book I want to talk about is The Beast by Lindsay Mead. So this was kind of an impulse buy on my Kindle and it was a book that I've been wanting to read for a while but I saw it was on sale and I nabbed it straight up. This is almost a steampunk retelling of Beauty and the Beast which at first seems a bit weird and at the start, like the first couple of chapters, even though I was completely sucked in, I had no idea how this world was kind of going to work and kind of intertwine with the original story, but she did so flawlessly. I absolutely adored the characterization of characters that are well loved and it was really nice to see how she has written them just slightly different from everyone else. 
This is why I really love retellings because you get to see a lot about the author and their mind and it's just so refreshing to see a story that you love retold through someone else's eyes. And while I know the Beauty and the Beast as a film and as a concept it's a little bit problematic, you know, a girl who's like enslaved and kept in a house. I know it's bad but I, I absolutely adore Beauty and the Beast. It's probably my favourite Disney film and yeah, it's a great book. This book was actually featured in my first reading vlog and if you want to know more about the book you can go check that out because I do talk about it in intervals as I'm reading it. So the time has come for my honourable mentions and they are All the Bright Places by Jennifer Niven and Fierce Fairy Tales by Nikita Gill. Nikita Jill? Nikita Jill. So let me just start with Fierce Fairy Tales. So this is actually the last book I read in 2018 and I actually read it a couple of hours before midnight while sitting at the restaurant where my partner works. And if you are a feminist and love anything fantastical, this is your book. I absolutely adore this book. It is poems and stories to stir your soul and stir my soul, they did. There are so many beautiful passages and it is, these are basically somewhat retellings of fairy tales that we know but through a feminist perspective. It also talks about characters that we often overlook or are told to hate such as the, the ugly sisters from Cinderella and the stepmother from Cinderella and we see why they are the way they are and honestly I hate them a lot less after reading this book and it, it is all about solidarity with women and but there's also a lot of feminism that benefits men in here so it talks about toxic masculinity and how it comes about and how we should just let men feel and how if we did that then the world would be a much better place not just for women but also for men so she really is a true feminist in that she forgets no one there are poc characters in this book there are men there are everyone there is everyone in this book i'm pretty sure there are some lgbtq plus characters in here too although I, you know it's been a couple of days so i've forgotten i have a terrible memory I really do want to read you one quote from the very beginning because I want this tattooed somewhere on my body because it is just so beautiful and as a writer and as someone who suffers from depression and has a lot of mixed emotions all the time, this really spoke to me. And it is the first poem and it is called A Universal Truth. We all have storms and stories inside our star-made bodies that even the night sky cannot hold. Like, that is just so beautiful. As soon, that is like the first thing I read in this book and as soon as I read it, I knew that I would love this book. So honestly, this didn't make my list because I think it transcends the list because I think it is an important read and I think everyone should pick it up. And now we get on to All the Bright Places by Jennifer Niven. Now I'm not gonna speak too much about this now because one, I'm not emotionally prepared to and two, I do wanna do a full review of this book because it absolutely deserves one. So I started this book on the 28th of January and I finished it on the 28th of December. Now that's not, I am a slow reader but I'm not that slow and the reason that it took me so long to read this book is because I honestly found it way too difficult to read in one sitting. It is the story of a girl who learns to live from a boy who wants to die. And just reading that had me choke up, so I'm gonna be brief. This is a story about Theodore Finch and Violet Markey, and Theodore ha suffers from many issues, one of them being depression, while Violet is still coming to terms with the loss of his sister, for which she blames herself. The story follows their friendship to a relationship and how depression will just slip in everywhere. It will tarnish good memories with bad thoughts and I think Jennifer Niven represented depression very well in this book. So, All the Bright Places absolutely broke my heart. And it mended it a little, but it did break my heart. And I honestly sobbed reading this book. If you do have depression, I would be cautious reading this book. If you're easily triggered, I would be cautious reading this book. If you can, I would read it simply because it is probably the most beautiful book I have ever read in my entire life. However, perhaps do what I did and read a couple of chapters at a time and scatter some happy books in the middle or some fa fantastical books to help you escape the reality of this beautifully poignant and very, very important book. 
So if you like this video, if you could please give it a big thumbs up or subscribe, that will make me super happy. If not, don't worry. And either way, I wish everyone a lovely, bookish and happy new year. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Thank you.